We're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 4, a long passage, and uh, then we'll be looking at John chapter 8 and two verses, verse 32 and 36. title of the message is uh, Set Free. A teacher asked a little boy uh, in her class uh, who signed, or uh, yeah, who wrote uh, the Declaration of Independence, and uh, he just looked at her and says, I, I don't know. And so she says, now I want you to study your history lesson. And the next day, he, she asked him again. And he still didn't know. And again the next day, and he still didn't know. One more day, and he still didn't know. So finally she said, uh, son, I'm going to have to call your, your daddy. And so her, his father came in, and she explained the situation. And she says, uh, he's really not studying his lessons. And he, uh, not only that, but he can't tell me uh, who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And the father uh, walked over to the son, and he kind of whispered in his ear a little bit. And he says, uh, son, listen, if you sign that thing, you better tell him so we can get out of here. We live in a free country, free from foreign rule. But of course, it wasn't that way in the beginning, was it? Our country, which had uh, originally been settled by the Indians uh, long before the white man drove them out, uh, drove them out much like the Jews drove out the Canaanites. However, uh, these white men were ruled by European countries. <clears throat> and in fact, the United States began as 13 colonies owned by Great Britain. Uh, the British had first settled Jamestown and had all the gall of naming the place after their king, James. In Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. And shortly after that, they kept spreading and all up and down the eastern sea coast of the United States they started forming colonies, and they formed 13 of them. But these colonies remained under British control for 169 years. And then when the colonies proclaimed their freedom, freedom from the mother country, the year was 1776. However, they had to fight a war that took five years before they became free. And yet, you know what? Even then, most Americans were not completely free. Most of the blacks were slaves, and the women couldn't vote. Blacks were freed in 1865 by the 13th Amendment, and that was followed uh, five years later uh, by the 15th Amendment. They were allowed to vote then. However, it was impeded by what was called the poll tax, and it wasn't until 1962 that they really were able to vote unimpeded uh, because the poll tax amendment did away uh, with the poll tax. 97 years after being freed, they were able to vote. Now, <clears throat> The women, women didn't get the right to vote until August the 18th, wonderful day. Good things happened on August the 18th. August the 18th, 1920. You know, it took hot wars for people to gain freedom in this country, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War. And it also took protests to gain other freedoms. Amendments 19 and 24. Basically, they dealt with what? That's all dealing with political freedom. Equal rights freedoms. Now Jesus, he offers eternal and spiritual freedom to all of us. 
And that's what we want to look at is freedom that Jesus offers, which crosses all racial and gender barriers. Jesus is freedom. Let's read. Let's read a story in John chapter 4 about a Samaritan woman. Now he had to go through Samaria talking about Jesus. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired as he was from the journey sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The water of life. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well's deep. Where can you get this? living water. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I, don't ha I won't get thirsty and so that I don't have to keep coming on up here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then Leaving her jar of water, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and they made their way forward toward him. 
Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Oh, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. It starts off with a little bit of historical uh, truth here. It talks about the <clears throat> him going to that well. The well had been dug about 1850 years before Jesus. It was about 950 years before Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. And it was about 900 years before the kingdom of Israel divided and the Israelites of the northern tribe began worshiping God near that place. And 721 years since the northern tribes were conquered and half-breed Samaritans began worshiping there. The point that was being made here and the point that the woman wanted to make to Jesus all through the time that they're talking is, is that, hey, you're a Jew. You claim to worship in Jerusalem. You claim that you have a precedent, that you have something um, more important. Uh, God's going to be nearer to you and everything. But listen. We have a heritage, a heritage that goes back even before you, a heritage that goes back even before, eh? Over, before the time of, of uh, Moses and the law, a time that goes all the way back to the son of Abraham. That's our heritage. And we have had a heritage of worshiping here off and on since then. It was a place. People dug a well, they thanked God. And Jacob was the first. So it has a historical value. And the Samaritan woman, when she came to draw water from the well, and she started, uh, well, Jesus started a little conversation with her. And he drew her into that conversation about life when he asked her for a little water. And it really wasn't the water that he really wanted to talk about. It was about life. About her life. Jesus wants to talk to you about your life. He wants to talk to you about your life. He asked for a drink. He asked for a drink. Now, as we, we go on, uh, the woman uh, kind of gives a little bit of a, a rebuttal. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. What in the world are you doing asking me for a drink? Because you see, uh, the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. They didn't associate with each other. 
The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and they especially didn't like Samaritan women. Who in the world is going to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman? But Jesus did. Jesus did. And of course, he began talking about living water. He was going to give her some water. And you know, it, it's, I, I really think that there's a lot of humor in this. And I almost think that she was kind of laughing at Jesus a little bit when she said, <laughs> Hey, you ask me for water. I'm the one with the bucket. Now you're telling me that you're going to give me water. And you don't have a bucket. And you don't have a rope. And hey, that well's kind of deep. Where do you think you're going to get the water? Do you think you're greater than our forefathers who dug this well? Do you think that? But of course, Jesus answered her and said, you know, anyone that drinks this water is going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. There will be a spring of water in them welling up to eternal life. He's saying, you misunderstand, lady. This is not about water that gives physical life. This is about water that gives eternal life. With the water I offer you, You'll never thirst again. And so what does the woman say? And I'm not really too sure about her tone of voice on this part either. And what she has to say. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. Now that, that part's pretty good. But then she adds to it, And I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. And I have to see the humor in that. Hey, I just don't feel like coming back up here to get water. Give me some that I won't have, so I won't have to. She still doesn't understand and seems to almost be laughing at him. Then Jesus says something that finally gets her attention. He said, go. Call your husband and come back. I'm going to tell you what, those are painful words. It was probably, she probably felt like a, a dagger was being stuck in her. Jesus had really cut her to the quick. Now, he didn't do it in a vicious way, and it wasn't meant that way. But it was simply meant to get her attention to wake her up. To wake her up. And he did. She says, I, I don't, don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You've had five. And the man that's living with you now isn't even your husband. Listen. That was... Very hurtful. You know, it was probably pretty well common knowledge around Sychar that she was married five times and living with a guy. And that's probably why she came alone at noon to get water. So she wouldn't have to put up with all those accusing stares. You know how you can stare at people. And really make them feel great. That is just the opposite. And all those muffled whispers. Psst, psst, psst. Hey, you know who she is, don't you? You know what that is. And they probably shunned her as an outcast like a leper. And they probably scooted over as far as they could away from her when they came anywhere around her. She had tried marriage. Five times she had tried it. And now this man wouldn't even marry her. 
And all of that probably explains her hardness and her cynicism. And although Jesus caused her pain, he broke through that outer shell that she had built around herself. She wasn't completely ready to give up her toughness, though, the toughness that had the years had forced upon her. So she tried to change the subject. She tried to change the subject. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. She changes it. She wants to talk about religion. Let's talk about the Samaritans and the Jews. Let's talk about who's right and wrong here in regard to that. Forget about me. I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about these things. Let's talk about religion. It's a good way to get out of it. And Jesus began to tell her some truth uh, about the future. The very fact that, hey, it's not always going to be like it is now. It's not going to always be worship up here on this mountain and worship down there in, in Jerusalem. Those things really don't matter. That's not what God's looking for. It's not where you worship God. It's not where. One place doesn't have precedence over another. One day, people are going to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And that's what God really wants. He wants our worship to be in spirit and in truth. He wants us to really love him. The woman responded that she knew the Messiah was coming. And he'll explain everything. At last, she came to the point that Jesus was wanting to get her to. Came to that point to where he could break in on her and give her the truth. And he said, ma'am, lady, you see who you're looking at? Well, the one you're looking at is the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the promised one of God. I'm the one who has the answers for you. I'm the one who can set you free. Set you free from all the sin. I can set you free. That's what Jesus was saying. And this truth had an impact. It had an impact. Of course, his disciples came in the meantime. But nevertheless, they came in and had a little discussion that we don't even need to get into. Uh, except for the very fact that Jesus told them, Hey, you guys are going to reap something you haven't even sown. What he was trying to say is, This woman's going to do the sowing for you. And you're going to do the reaping. Because what did she do? She left that jar of water. She was so excited. She headed back into Sychar. She overcame all of those fears that she had had of separation. Those fears of being an outcast. She didn't care what anybody thought now. Because she knew Jesus. And she wanted them to know. And so she came and she told him, she said, hey, can't this be the Christ? Can it be? And so what did they do? They followed her back with, to see Jesus. And some of them believed her. And of course, they had to believe her to some degree because they went with her. And they went to check it out. 
it seemed that we have two ideas here. Some believed. Some believe enough to say, hey, I, I believe you, but I'm going to check it out for myself. And they did. And they went. And it says that many of those Samaritans believed. Jesus stayed there for two days teaching them and preaching to them and saving them. Samaritans, non-Jews, but they were being saved. Jesus was setting them free. The truth, the truth brings freedom. I want to read two more verses. Chapter 8, verses 32, and chapter 8, verse 36. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And 36, so if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. This woman felt that freedom, a freedom that she hadn't felt, if she ever felt it, since she was a little girl. Freedom. Freedom from her sin. Jesus was giving her that. Here was a woman, all in tangled with sin, and all the heartaches that came with it. She had been scorned and ashamed and lonely and dejected and rejected, full of pain, hardened by sin's grip on her life. And then she met Jesus. And Jesus changed her life. She was now filled with hope and excitement. She had met a man who saw her for what she was, who saw her for who she was, and he didn't condemn her. He offered her hope. It was not facing the truth about herself that set her free. It was coming face to face with the truth himself. Face to face with God. Face to face with Jesus Christ. Face to face with the one who doesn't whitewash our sin. Doesn't say, well, that's okay or it doesn't matter. No, God does. that's not God's way. God's way is forgiveness. You have sinned, but God offers forgiveness. Forgiveness is made possible because Jesus Christ died to pay the price of our sins. Listen, God loves us, and he wants to forgive us if we'll only believe in Jesus Christ. If we believe in Him and trust in Him, we can have our sins washed away. Washed away so that we can go down in that water, rise up a newness of life because we have touched the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us and makes us whole. Do you believe? Do you believe enough that you're willing to say, yes, I believe in Jesus? Do you believe enough that you want to be baptized into Christ and to rise in that newness of life? We're going to have an invitation hymn. And uh, Josh is going to come forward. And uh, if you've got a decision that you need to make, uh, we ask you to come and do it at this time. Josh? Our invitation hymn will be 440.
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing the first and second verses of 440, and let's all stand. 